define what so that you can wade through it very quickly. Uh, the book is divided into several parts, and the parts are divided into several chapters. The first chapter is about the genesis of data simulation, historical perspective, classifications of model, sensitivity analysis, predictability. You heard a lot of words sensitivity and predictability this morning. So we provide a broad overview, which is very similar to the talk that Chris gave in a much more uh, expanded fashion, chapter one. In chapter two, we provide simple examples, illustrative, to be able to motivate what data simulation is all about. And uh, the, in, in, in that process, we talk about deterministic as well as stochastic models. Uh, the, in, in part three, we talk about uh, specific applications and we collect. So we have to decide, do we talk about applications at various points or do we collect all the applications in one place? so that we can then refer the people to the applications. We prefer the latter. So you can see several different applications from fluid dynamic, fluid dynamic, oceanography, atmospheric chemistry, meteorology, atmospheric physics. So we have collected we have a good set of sample problems. So those of you who plan to teach, uh, you could utilize these simple models from various applied areas to be able to illustrate various concepts. In chapter four, we talk about the simple history of data simulation starting from the early works of astronomers starting from Gauss. Part two, then we talk about deterministic static models. In chapter five, we talk about the least squares. You may realize that it is chapter five I finished. Chapter six is about projection and, 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 and invariance. I didn't talk about the invariance, but then you, are, you got the idea of projection. Chapter seven is going to be nonlinear, which I'm going to pick up very soon. Chapter eight is the recursive version within the deterministic setup. So this is, if you want to call this, is the deterministic version of the Kalman filter. So chapter five, six, seven, eight is in, in totality deterministic static case. Then part three, we wanted to make the book computation uh, self-contained. So we talk about lots of matrix theory related algorithms, matrix method, Cholesky decomposition, QR decomposition, similar value decomposition. We don't simply give the algorithm, we prove everything. Nothing is taken for granted. Why? One of the things we found out by teaching this course to meteorologists and petroleum engineers and civil engineers, it is not enough to give them the algorithm. You need to know where they come from. So that's the reason why the book grew in size. Just about every result we try to prove. Uh, uh, then we talk about optimization techniques, steepest descent. We prove convergence. We prove various notions of convergence, introduce various notions of convergence, conjugate gradient method, Newton quasi-Newton methods. Uh, for all these things, we have extensive analysis. Then statistical estimation. We bring in, the, uh, we provide an overview of various statistical techniques, principles of statistical estimation, statistical least squares, maximum likelihood, Bayesian estimation technique, from Gauss to Kalman. Okay, that's the chapter that summarizes the, the, the impact of the work done in statistical theory of estimation to data simulation. That provides a very nice bridge with all the fundamentals in, uh, in, in, in statistical estimation techniques. <laughs> then comes the uh, stochastic static model. We introduce the notions. We, we quickly review some of the classical techniques for data simulation developed by meteorological community during the 50s and the 60s that led to the notion of Bayesian formulation 3D war. And chapter one, uh, 21 is a, um, is, a, is a strange piece, it's spatial filters. If, if you work with um, um, meteorological models, sometimes there will be certain nuisance. For, for example, you want to filter the gravity waves. Computationally, certain, certain kinds of waves could, could create trouble. So how do you filter some of these waves? So what are the mathematical spatial filters that are involved in here? This is essentially from signal processing literature. So we wanted to provide a very nice uh, view of uh, spatial digital filters, which can be very used in conjunction with the meteorological model to be able to concentrate on uh, or to move the chaff from the con. That's the idea of those filters. Then comes the f uh, next part, data simulation using deterministic dynamic model. This is the bulk where we talk about 4D war, which we will talk about tomorrow. We illustrate it by a simple straight line problem, first order joint method, first order joint method, linear dynamics, nonlinear dynamics, second order joint method, 
then we also provide a recursive view, a recursive statistical view of, of, of 4D war. That brings a very nice bridge to Kalman filters. Kalman filter, what it is? Kalman filter part one, part two. We prove many of the well-known properties of Kalman filters. It is known that there are at least six different ways to derive Kalman filters. We have done a couple of different formulations to be able to provide the, the beauty of the mathematics behind Kalman filter derivation. Then we have a very detailed discussions on nonlinear filters, um, approximation to nonlinear filters. Then the reduced rank filters, ensemble filtering, reduced rank square root filters, chapter 30, hybrid filters, applications of Kalman filter in our review. And the last chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, the last part is on predictability. Much of what Eric talked about is contained in chapters 31 and 32. Predictability, a stochastic view. Your predictability, a deterministic view. You can readily see uh, classifications of stability of equilibria. What he called fixed point, we call it equilibria, which are essentially the same, same thing. Linear dynamics, nonlinear dynamics, lack of stability. Uh, role of similar vectors in predictability. The, one of the fundamental theorems of, of, of Lapinov index, Lapinov vectors, uh, deterministic ensemble approach to predictability, and so on. And then we have a sequence of appendices, finite dimensional vector space, matrices, concept of multivariate calculus, optimization in finite dimensional vector space, and analysis, concept of probability theory, Fourier transforms, and so on. So that essentially is a summary of the book. Now you know where to find which part, and so on and so forth. So with that, I'm now going to go back to where we uh, quit. Okay, I, I'm, I'm told this will be here, so we are going to be utilizing those two. Um, I'm now going to quickly talk about nonlinear versions of the results that we derived last class, but I'm not going to go into the details. I'm going to, because we now know most of the tools and techniques. I don't want to be working problems. I'm going to give you problems, but I'm going to provide the conceptual links. That way we can see many of the ideas that are involved. So what is the idea here? I have z is equal to h of x. h is a function that maps the model space to the observation space. This is x. This is z. Can I all see this, please? This color is good? OK. <coughs> H is the nonlinear function. So what is H? H is a function from Rn to Rm. This is the vector valued function of a vector. You may have heard Eric say that. The function x dot is equal to f of x. In his case, that's a vector valued function of a vector. So what is H of x? H of x is equal to H1 of x, H2 of x, Hm of x. And x itself is x1, x2, Xn. So x stays in Rm, z stays in Rm, h is a vector in, in Rm. Uh, so what is, the, what is the idea here? x may be the temperature of the skin of the earth, z may be the amount of energy radiated as measured by a satellite. And what is h represents? h represents the radiation laws, Stefan's law, Planck's law. And we all know the amount of energy radiated is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature difference. So they're highly nonlinear. If x represents the amount of rain in a cloud, z represents the, the radiance as, as viewed through the radar. And that's an empirical function, which are highly nonlinear. There are logarithmic functions and, and, and other things. In so, so what is the idea here? Knowing the radiance, uh, measuring the reflectivity, how do I measure the amount of rainfall? Knowing the energy radiated, how do I calculate the temperature? For the, for the tutorial, I'm going to be utilizing a satellite-based problem for you to be able to implement essentially what I'm going to be doing, and the tutorial will be on Friday, as, as, as we all know. <laughs> so what is the idea here? The idea here is to be able to, so given z and the functional form of h, my job is to be able to estimate x. This problem in meteorological literature has been known as retrieval problem. I want to be able to retrieve the temperature by measuring the energy radiated. So look at the, now how, how many different terminologies we have come. Retrieval, inverse, regression, all be nearly the same thing. Each terminology is popular in a particular circle. 
Okay, so what is our idea? Our idea is to be able to, so let me state the problem now. Given z and the functional form of h, find an optimal estimate of x such that the error in the estimate is minimal. Are you with me? Hey, we have started walking the same path. We have cut a trail. We are simply trying to walk that trail again and again and again and again. It is that mode of thought process I would like to be able to promote. And that's, that, that's, that's what we are after. So what is the idea here? Z minus H of X. That's the error. That's the vector. Transpose Z minus H of X. If I know the errors in the measurements, we all know it could be noisy. If V is assumed to be Gaussian with the covariance R, if you know the properties of V, you, you put an R inverse. If you don't know the properties of that, you put simply close your eyes. Are you me? That's the idea here. So I have a J function. This is Jfx. So what is this? This is the weighted sum of squares of errors. Why is where the square sum, where the weight comes in, this is the weight. Where the square comes in, I'm multiplying the same quantity with itself. All with me? So what is the only difference? Here I had earlier, for those of us who are interested in the structural part of it, I had h times x, I had h times x. If this is, in this case, this is linear, so the product is quadratic. But in general, this h function itself is highly nonlinear, so this is one degree, one order more nonlinear than h of x because I'm multiplying h of x with itself. Okay? Good. Now, what are the two? What are the approaches? One way would be to calculate the gradient with respect to x of j of x equal to zero because the functional form of h is known. With a little bit of hard work, you can compute the gradient. That should be no, no difficulty. It's, a multi, it's an exercise in multivariate calculus. I don't have to go through that. I'm sure you can do better than I do. So what do we need to do? An optimal x is contained in the solution to that. But what are these? These are horrendously nonlinear system of algebraic transcendental. So largely, this could be a transcendental equation because we don't know what h's are. Do we know how to solve this? So this equation looks like solving for f of x is equal to 0. That's what numerical analysis uh, is all about. There are tons of different ways of trying to find roots of equations, okay? solving nonlinear equations. What is one of the most robust, stable method? Newton's method. Okay? So one possible way to, to, to solve this is to be able to compute the gradient set to 0 create a set of nonlinear equations, use well-known methodology to be able to solve this set of nonlinear equations, you get the solution. So solve this. You need, you need to know goodly many results from uh, uh, numerical, numerical analysis. What's our alternate way? The alternate way would be, so what is it we are trying to do? We are trying to solve the exact problem approximately. Solve the exact problem approximately. Where does approximation come in? In the numerical algorithm that we are going to use. What is the alternate idea? The alternate idea is you, you get an approximation to the problem and solve the approximate problem exactly. Get an approximate problem, approximation to the problem, and solve it exactly. And then iterate. And then iterate. So this, I would like to say, is a dark technique. This is an approximation technique. It's a kind of a perturbation technique. Perturbation technique. And that's what I'm going to describe the next few minutes. As again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring the prop, state the problem, bring the key ideas, and then leave the routine things as exercise. 
I don't know. Hey, we are all sophisticated by now. We are already sophisticated. We have become a little bit more sophisticated in the past couple of days. So there's no point repeating things we already know. How to compute gradient, how to compute Hessian. I don't want to waste time. We all know that. What do you mean? Hey, this, these are the two possible approaches. So, yes, good. In a case, yeah. Yes. 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 So what then we need to do next? We need to be able to find the solutions. And each of the solutions of this, you have to compute the Hessian and check for positive definiteness or negative definiteness to be able to declare it's a maxima, minima, critical points, so on and so forth. So this is only part of the job. Are you may? Come on guys. So what are we going to do? We are not going to have the headache of being able to check. And so what is the idea here? You make a quadratic approximation to that. Quadratic functions have unit minimum. So I don't have to worry about sufficiency too much. And that's where. So what is the preparation idea? You, give, you are given a nonlinear problem. Methodologically, this is ideologically, this is what I would like to be able to impart. I have a nonlinear problem. I have a current operating point xc. So what does it mean? As I, as I mentioned in the last class, engineers, scientists are very clever people. They don't know the exact solution, but they know the region where the solution lies. It is a prior knowledge about the disposition of the solution enables them to be able to pick a good initial condition. They don't pull the initial condition out of the sky. They have a pretty good idea of where the initial condition comes from. So let us assume Xc is a current operating point or initial condition if you wish. So how does this perturbation technique work or approximation technique work? I'm going to represent my function hfx in a Taylor series expansion in a small neighborhood around Xc. So this is the Xc. There is a small neighborhood in the state space. Let us assume this is the n of xc, the neighborhood of that. Within this space, I'm going to represent my function x, h of x, by a quadratic, by a linear. I, don't mean, I, could, I could approximate by a linear function. I could approximate by a quadratic function. If I approximate by a linear function, that's called first order perturbation technique, or first order approximation. If I use the yeah, second order approximation, that's called second order method, I'm going to talk about the connection between both the first order as well as second order. So to get the ball rolling, let me do the first order. Are you me? So what does what does what does Taylor say? Taylor is our good friend. Are you me? So given a function under so I'm going to now assume what? My function h is such that H belongs to C2. What is mean by C2? The every component of H are com have continuous partial derivatives of order 2. So what does this give you? I'm, I'm, I, 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 have, I'm, I have a very safe disposition to be able to talk about second order Taylor series, first order Taylor series, and so on. So under certain conditions of smoothness of the map H involved in here, I can now do the following. I can approximate this in this neighborhood by H of Xc plus the Jacobian of H, the, the Jacobian of H at the point Xc times X, X minus Xc. How many of you are familiar with the Jacobian and first order? You all know Taylor series approximation in univariate calculus. This is the Taylor series approximation in the multivariate vector valued functions. How many of you are with me? That's right. Is there anybody uh, you think I need to talk about this a little bit more? Silence implies consent. Are you with me? Cry baby gets milk. Uh, that's the rule I have in my class. If you don't ask a question, I'm assuming you, you know it. There is no, there's no second way about it. Are you there? Good. So what is this Jacobian? Um, uh, let's, let's just write for the fun of it. This Jacobian is essentially, you first take my first component, H1. 
So partial of h1 with respect to x1, partial of h1 with respect to x2, partial of h1 with respect to xn, partial of hi with respect to x1, partial of hi with respect to x2, partial of hi with respect to xn, partial of hn with respect to x1, partial of hn with respect to x2, partial of hn with respect to xn. Oh, so what is this? The, there are n rows, there are n columns, this is a m by n, so this is a m by n, x is a n vector, x is a n vector, this is a m by 1, so this is a m vector, this is a m vector, so everything is good. So what, what, what does this tell you? This tells you the following, for those of us who would like to get a feel for this, suppose I have a parabola, if this is an operating point, I, I consider the tangent. In small region, the, the, the parabola doesn't, uh, uh, is not too far away from the tangent. I can make a tangent linear approximation, and that's what first order. So this is the univariate visualization of what happens in here. So what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm simply going to plug, replace this with this in here. All of it may? Good. So while I'm there, I would like to now talk about the second order approximation as well. I would like to finish all the approximations in here. So the second order approximation is going to be H of X of C plus D H X of C X minus X of C plus. I'm going to <laughs> call this D square H x of c, x. It's a complex term. I'm going to talk about that now. So what is this? <laughs> Do you remember? So I would like to draw an analogy to get a high in here. Maybe I'll, I'll put a half in here. You all know there's a half. So if I have a function, I'm sorry, f of x, the Taylor series expansion, the second order Taylor series expansion around xc, f of xc plus gradient, I'm sorry, df by dx at xc times x minus xc plus one half of d squared f by dx squared at xc times x minus xc squared. So I am interested in the vector analog of this. Are you me? So what is that going to be? This d squared h xc x is going to be is a vector is the vector size m by 1, why everybody is, an, is a vector size m by 1. So what is the first thing? So uh, let me, let me, let me, so this is the function, when the function is from R to R. When the function is from Rn to R, what is the second order Rayleigh series expansion? f of x is equal to f of xc plus gradient of f at xc transpose times x minus xc. Are you me? Uh, this is the analogous term of that. Plus, what is the next one? This one is x minus xc transpose the Hessian of f of xc times x minus xc. I would like to build your intuition slowly and steadily. So this is for the function r to r. This is for the function rn to r. What do I have? I have a h from rn to rn. Once you understand this analogy. So now you, you can readily see the rows of this are essentially the gradients as rows. So direct analogy. Now I would like to be able to get this. So what is the first component of H? H1. So I have x minus xc, the gradient, I'm sorry, the Hessian of H1 at xc times x minus xc. x minus xc gradient, h2 of xc x minus xa, x minus xa gradient of h, m of xa, x minus xa. So what, uh, what happens in here? You have each component. So what is it? These components are independent. So what did you do? You do a second order Taylor series for this using this. 
you do a second order trailer series for using this, you do a second order trailer series for using this, slap them all together. They are all independent. So what is this vector? This vector consists of terms like this. But what are these terms? These are quadratic terms. Where the matrix of the quadratic term depends on the Hessian of the components. Hessian of the components. All of you there? How many of you with me? Good. So, you know, if, if, so I can erase the whole thing. I would like to keep this to remind ourselves that this one is, uh, is a complex term which consists of this. So, second degree term, first degree term first degree term. So if I plugged this, if I plug this, I get first order approximation, I get second order approximation. So that's so if you if you give a problem to a physicist, he looks at it from his own training. If you look at a problem to a mathematician, he looks at it from a mathematical perspective. So the perspectives depends on what you know how you are trained, the way you think. Are, are and, and so the perspective that we are going to realize is that using the perspective of the, 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 the quadratic approximations, quadratic functions, as we have seen. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, is there a what that? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. The first one. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I missed it. Thank you. You're right. <coughs> The quadratic form. <laughs> I had a transposition here, sure. Yeah. Okay, the battle around. So you can see a lot of homework coming out. Instituted first order approximation, J of x. So because it is a first order approximation, I'm not going to call it J of x, I'm going to call it Q1 of x. Q1 of x is equal to, or J of x is approximately equal to Q1 of x, which is equal to, okay, good. Now, we have seen the last class. I can either do this, I, or I can slap a half here. That is me. Nothing is going to change. We already argued why I can do create mischief without changing anything. Good. So, this is going to be 1 half of z minus h of x c minus d x c of h x minus x c. I'm talking about the first order. So this is minus. I'm going to substitute this term. I get here. I have an odd inverse. I would like you to get a quick aha very soon. d h x c x minus x c transpose. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, this is the vector, this is the h evaluated xc, this is the known quantity, so I'm simply going to call this vector g. Why? Well, I don't want to write too many things. So this is equal to one half of g minus d h x e x c x minus x c transpose or inverse g minus d h x a x minus x a. The aha comes right here. What did we have in last class? We had last class one half of z minus h of x transpose or inverse z minus h of x. You remember that please? And my claim is that if you know how to do this, you already know how to do this. Why? Let us see the analogy now. Instead of Z, I have G. Both are vectors, known vectors of size M. Instead of H, what is H? H was a M by M matrix. What is this? A Jacobian. Jacobian plays the role of H. What is Jacobian? That is M by M. Instead of X, I have X minus XC. I can handle, I can handle that. This terms of this. Okay, now this term, this matrix is known. Why? That's a Jacobian of H evaluated at my current operating point. I know the function, I know the Jacobian, I know the current operating point, I can numerically evaluate that matrix. You all have an aha here? That's right. 
So now, do you see this is a quadratic term? How many of you may know? This is a linear approximation. This is a linear approximation. Product is quadratic. So locally, in a small neighborhood around my operating point, look at this now. Eric's lecture. There is a current, the position of the pendulum. Small errors. The, 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 the error circle. Are you me? Nonlinear systems. Perturbation technique. I want you to know perturbation technique is your best friend for analysis of nonlinear system. In fact, you may even say that's only one method that has been known to work in many, 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 many situations. Okay. Am I done? My claim is I'm done. Yes. So what happens if your Jacobian at x is zero? Ah, good point. So, so what are what, what are we talking about now? If the Jacobian is, is zero, means what? What happens at the minimum? Well, in this particular case, I don't have to talk about the minimum of j. But then, uh, if 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 the Jacobian is zero, means what? It relates to the properties of the function. So what is the condition we are assuming? At the current operating point, the function behavior is such that the Jacobian is full rank. I need that. Why? For to solve this problem, h was to be full rank. If I want to apply this theory to this case, and if I'm going to equate the Jacobian to h, the Jacobian must inherit all the properties of h I had assumed earlier. That's right. That's right. So, so the, 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 that relates to the properties of the function h. That's right. That's a good point. Are we done? My claim is I'm done. Why? Once you know this analogy, I don't want to bore you. So, what is the idea here? Compute the gradient of q1 of x equal to zero. Compute the Hessian of q1 of x and verify this is SPD. Verify XP, SPD. I'm going to give you the ultimate formula that you have to check. So what is the, what is the optimal x minus xe? x minus xe that minimizes, the x that minimizes this is going to be given by this. So what is the equation? What is the normal, what is the corresponding normal equation for this? D H X C transpose R inverse D H X C times X minus X E is equal to D H X E transpose R inverse <laughs> R inverse G. Okay, that's the equation. You know, wonder where, uh, where do I give this? Please remember, this is the analog of this. H transpose R inverse H times X is equal to H transpose R inverse Z. H is replaced by DH. R inverse is R inverse. My Z is replaced by, by, by G. Everybody in the place? So if you have done this, you know this. What is this? Um, um, I, have under, I have under tacit assumption my H is such that Jacobian is a full rank. So this matrix is non-singular. It is symmetric and positive definite. This is the linear system. We would like to be able to solve this linear system. Everybody in the place? So what is that I get? I get a solution x minus xc. Let us assume this is equal to y. Uh, uh, this is equal to some value. Are you me? Uh, um, um, I, I also assume that, that, that the solution to this is eta. So what is the new new x? This implies x is equal to xc plus eta. So what am I trying to do? I had an old operating point xc. I computed the eta. I'm going from here to here. This is my new operating point xc. So I'm going to replace xc is equal to xc plus eta, where eta is the solution of this. And what do I do? I do, I, I repeat this. In this new operating point, I'm going to evaluate the Jacobian. Now, do I have to evaluate? Yeah, I already had the functional form of Jacobian. 
I simply need to do yeah, an evaluation. The problem is well set up. The problem is well set up. Are you me? So there are two loops. There is an outer loop, there is an inner loop. What is the inner loop doing? The inner loop tries to solve this symmetric positive definite system. The outer loop updates the approximation. So you juggle from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. When do you stop? The instant when eta is very small, doesn't make a dent. You all have an aha, please? First order approximation. So this is 3UR. This is what you will be doing in meteorology. Very seldom meteorological problems are linear. Are you with me? How many of you are with me? How many of you? Hey, raise your hand, guys. You all have a good breakfast, right? That's right. You know what keeps you kicking? Good cup of tall, hot coffee that keeps you kicking. How many? Oh, so I don't want to differentiate another thing. I already quoted the result. So this is the version of the 3D war for the nonlinear case, first order approximation. Likewise, I'm going to indicate how I'm going to utilize the second order to show you the major steps. Any questions? OK. Sometimes I feel guilty. Maybe I'm going too fast. I don't want to lose you. So keep nodding your head. Keep nodding your head. I'm looking for people who do this way. If you say no, I will stop. Please. How many of you? OK. Let's. What is Eric doing this morning? Nonlinear systems, locality. What is the, where was he focusing to put his or her fixed points? Equilibria. For his problem, equilibria is a good place to start. For our point, I don't know where the optimal is, but I have a pretty darn good feel for where to start. So I put my approximation around my initial guess. Let's see, current operating point. That varies from problem to problem. The guess could vary from people to people, but the method is guaranteed to converge. OK, now comes another important question. Do you solve? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh, go ahead, please. If you don't see the way you have set up the problem, the inner loop is not really a loop. It's just solving the matrix equation. I'm, I'm going to, that's exactly the point I was okay. trying to talk about. Right. 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 Good. Uh, OK, uh, here comes the basic idea. What is, how do you solve x is equal to b? You can do a HLSK, you can do a QR, you can do an SVD. So methods for solving linear systems are of two types. One is called direct method, another is called iterative methods. What are direct techniques? LU decomposition, Cholesky decomposition, uh, QR decomposition, SVD. These are by and large. What are the iterative methods? The good old Jacobi method, gauss seidel method, SOR techniques, and various notions. That there are books and books and books written on iterative techniques. Are you me? There are a number of beautiful convergence results available for this. Uh, so it could be an iterative technique. So if you are going to be using iterative technique, you can think of it as a loop. If you are going to be thinking of as a direct method, it is not a loop, but it is a block. Are you I also want to tell you one more thing. There is an equivalence between solving, minimizing the aquatic form x transpose ax minus bx, this is equal to f of x. Do, do, do you all agree this is the quadratic form? Let us take one half. a is spd. Where does the minimum occur? Delta f of x is equal to ax minus b. And this is equal to 0. That gives rise to ax is equal to b. So what does it mean? Minimizing a quadratic function 
with their symmetric positive definite matrix is equivalent to solving a linear system with a symmetric positive definite matrix or solving a linear system with symmetric positive definite matrix is equal to solving a minimization problem. Alpha for my players? Hey, the proof is. And, and what is the, one of the best ways of solving these kinds of things? Conjugate gradient method. Conjugate gradient methods were essentially developed in the early days to be able to solve quadratic minimization problems. Conjugate gradient technique ideally is a dark technique, but in practice is an iterative technique. Why? Uh, mathematically, you require conjugacy. Numerically, you cannot get perfect conjugacy. So, so mathematically, you can show that conjugate gradient algorithm converges in no more than the size of the dimension. But in practice, what do you do? Because of the loss of conjugacy arising out of finite precision arithmetic, you may have to do once, do twice, do twice. So, practically, it's an iterative procedure. Theoretically, is a dark technique. So, I could utilize conjugate gradient technique too. I could utilize conjugate. So, I would like to put conjugate gradient in both ways, but you know what I'm talking about. So, when I say iterative procedure, it all depends on what kind of method you are going to use. Conjugate gradient techniques are extremely powerful techniques to solve quadratic problems, especially for problems where the matrix is such that its eigenvalues are distributed widely. In other words, the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue, which is called the condition number, is, is, is not well conditioned. Uh, 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 you may have problems even in conjugate gradient technique, but there are improvements of conjugate gradient technique, which are called trilo suspense technique. One of the basic methods in Carlos of first technique is called Jimras. Generalized, yeah, generalized method of residuals. Jimras is one of the very good methodology, which is an offshoot of uh, application of Carlos of space technology to 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 solving these systems. So, I would like you to 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 remember that you have a lot of choice to be able to solve the resulting quadratic minimization, either as a direct technique or as an iterative technique. If I had it my way, my choice would always be conjugate gradient. Yeah. Why did you use the second order method? I'm, I'm going to come to the second order method very soon. I'm, I'm still talking about first order technique. What, what's the question? Yeah, I'm not saying this is the only way. There are lots of lots of techniques. I'm, I'm simply trying to give you uh, quasi Newton techniques. Sure. If I didn't mention something, that does not mean it's not applicable. Uh, that's a caveat. That's a, uh, so there are tons and tons of techniques available here. There are tons and tons of techniques available here. So how do you solve this resulting system? In this class, we have been talking about only direct methods, QR, SVD. But I don't want you to think there's only one. All right with me? OK. If I had my choice, I would utilize Jimras or conjugate gradient because they're pretty good techniques. And, and what is the difference between direct technique and iterative technique? In direct techniques, you cannot stop before, earlier. You got to finish everything. Do this, 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 and that. Boom, you get the solution. In iterative technique, you can watch out. If I'm getting close, depending on how satisfied you are, you can cut it. I was in. Um, I was working uh, uh, in a summer at the uh, Forecast Research Systems Lab in Boulder. They were in charge of predicting the weather during the Atlanta Olympics. They were using a local model. They had a rapid update cycle scheme where they were to predict every six hours, and every six hours they have to solve a problem of very large size. And and if you were to wait for the convergence, it will take forever. What did they do? They set up prayer. After 50 iterations, they cut it. Why? Because by the next six hours, other data set coming. They had to start the next forecast cycle. Are you making this? So where do you cut? How much approximation you do? Depends on the amount of computing power you have, the amount of time you're allowed. 
and so on. So iterative techniques have that ability to be able to cut. Direct technique, once you start, until it gives control back to you, you simply have to wait and watch. That is the, so I'm not criticizing any method. I'm not saying one method is better than other. These are all the properties of these techniques. We, as an analyst, need to know all of this in making a proper choice. Good. Any questions on that, place? So if you think there are other methods you know, add to this list, please. Newton is one of them. Quasi-Newton is one of them. You remember there is a chapter on Quasi-Newton. Quasi-Newton algorithms are very good, but it's also expensive because I had to estimate the Hessian. There's always a trade-off in methodologies. Good. So now, now that I have covered yeah, the good ground in here, I'm now going to essentially talk about Q2 of X, which is called one half of Z minus H of X of C, D, H. I'm not going to put X of C because I'm getting tired. I know what it is. That's what I'll tell you. If you know what the symbol means, you don't have to do too many things. Um, X minus X C minus D square H. I'm not going to say D square H of da 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 da. We all know what that one is. I'm, I'm simply going to tell you what are all coming in the pike and how this problem is slightly different. Okay, I call this G. I call this G. So let me write that down once more. This is G minus D H X minus X C minus one half of D square H transpose or inverse Z G minus D H X minus X C minus one half of D square H. Oh, originally I had only two terms. Now I had an extra term. This is the second order polynomial in x minus xc. How many of you with me? This is the second order polynomial in x minus xc. If I multiply this, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a fourth order polynomial. So what I'm going to do? I'm simply looking for a quadratic approximation. So I will multiply. I will keep all the terms up to second order. Anything above second, I will throw it out of the window. Look at this now. I'm making a second level of approximation. But I'm going to show this approximation is better than the previous approximation. But before I do that, I want you to see the basic ideas in here. This is a second degree term. This second degree term and multiplied with this is the fourth degree term. This is a first degree term. This is a second degree term. When you multiply, you get a third degree term. This is a second degree term. You multiply this, you get a second degree term. This is a first degree term. This is a first degree term. You multiply, you get a second degree term. So what's going to happen? I'm going to get one more second degree term in here by virtue of the presence of this second degree term. And that's what makes this different from the previous one. So let me quickly summarize. I don't think I remember this. So permit me to copy that from my book. So this is going to be Q1, Q2. That's right. Q2. So in our book, what is that we do? We again simplify the notation. We say y is equal to x minus xc. But I don't think I, I want to worry about that. So this is going to be equal to, why don't I just do that instead of looking at it and copying it. So gg transpose, I'm sorry, g transpose r inverse g minus g transpose dh x minus xc minus one half of g times d square h. This would give me another term, dx transpose x minus xc, I'm sorry, transpose, this is the transpose r inverse. So did I forget the r inverse in here? This is r inverse, uh, <laughs> r inverse g minus one half of dh x minus xc transpose r inverse dh x minus xa. All of me. Then I had to multiply this with this. 
that will be minus one half of d, d square h, I'm sorry, d square h transpose of g. So I have a term with this. I have, so constant term, first degree term, second degree term, first degree term, second degree term, second degree term. Every other term will give rise to a term that is greater than, greater than second degree. So who is the newcomer? These two are equal. So I can replace one of these by factor two. You remember that? If you have been doing this, I'm, I'm doing this for the sixth time now. You all know that. So these two are essentially the same. These two guys are also the same. This guy, you already know, the old friend. So this is our old friend. This is our old friend. This is our old friend. Who is the new guy? The new guy in town is this. So what is that we call? We call Q1, we call Q2 as a full quadratic approximation. Full quadratic approximation. Q1 is the partial quadratic approximation. So what does it mean? If your H function is such that in this neighborhood, it is very strongly nonlinear. Second order approximation will be a better approximation than the first order approximation. If h of x is a mild nonlinearity, first order approximation may be may, may suffice. All of it may come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah, you, you need to go r inverse. You know it. Uh, whatever I have missed R inverse, that's right. If you know I have made a mistake, you understood it, right? I don't mean, if you're able to find my mistake, I'm done. My job is done. I want you to have that aha quickly. I also want you to remember that who is the newcomer for this game in Q2? The Q2 term involves a term involving this. I don't mean, that's right. So we call this, we call this full quadratic approximation as opposed to partial quadratic approximation. I'm done. Why? Now, what do I do? I simply need to take gradient of x of q2 of x is equal to 0. I'm guaranteed a unique minimum. Why? It's a quadratic function. So I don't need to worry about sufficiency. I'm guaranteed by virtue of my approximation. So when you compute the gradient of this equated to 0, I get an equation. I'm simply going to quote that equation so that you need to check. Anyway, you all have a copy of the book. I, 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 so it is e easy for you to, even if you didn't take the notes, you know where I, where I am. So I'm now going to, I'm now going to give you the, 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 the final equation. The final equation comes like this. I'm going to discuss the structure of the final linear system to be solved. <coughs> so dH transpose or inverse dH dH plus plus <coughs> plus summation BK x a del square h of k of x a. That is losing juice. That times that times x minus x a. That is equal to that is equal to that is equal to d h transpose r inverse z minus h of x e, which is, which is essentially g, which is essentially g. So look at this now, second, the matrix now. Do you remember, this is our old guy, old friend, d h transpose r inverse h. Uh, d h, um, um, so this is morphed into d h because h is replaced by the Jacobian. So this is our old friend. This is what I want to find. This is H transpose R inverse Z. How many of you are me? Structurally. 
there is a there is an isomorphism in the structure of these equations. That's what I want to do. So who is the newcomer? The newcomer is this guy. Now who is he? He is a linear combinations of the Hessians of the components of H. All of you may? Now earlier I said this is symmetric partial definite. Now I need to make sure the sum is symmetric partial definite. That's a little bit more tricky. All of, all of, all of it, my place? Come on, guys. Now, so what is that I, I'm trying to do? You can really see second order approximation captures the second derivative information about the H function and brings it to the table so that he also has a say in the result. So if the second order approximation, if you go back to the first order approximation, this is zero. So the results very nicely nest themselves. They very nicely nest themselves. You can get special cases by setting certain things. You know. What are BKs? BKs are coefficients of linear combination. The details are arithmetic. I will leave it as an exercise. And that's the solution for the nonlinear problem. So we have seen 3D war in all its beauty and glory. Are you me? That's right. So you know 3D for cold now. Do you? That's right. The silence is deafening sometimes. Are you me? Okay. I'm going to do one little thing before uh, lunch now. I, we, have, we have 12.30? Okay, good. It's okay, thank you. He's always nice, right? Oh, I'm now going to talk about quickly about what's called recursive algorithm in, within the deterministic domain that is very similar to Kalman. Now, I don't want you to think that Kalman is always recursive, deterministic types are not. No, it is not the case. There's a very beautiful recursive way to do things. What is recursive way? I have an optimal, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, that's right, that, 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 that's a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to debate you. Sure, let's do that now. Let's do that. Yes, indeed, indeed, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, let me do that now. You are, you are right. So, he's right. I am going to be asking for an estimate. I have an observation. Observation contains information about x through this. I also have a background. The observation has an error that is equal norm, uh, normal with R, and this also has a covariance. I'm assuming somebody had given me the covariance B. That's right. I've only talked about this part. He's, he's, pretty, he's pretty right. I have to bring in this term too. So there's one more term for you to handle. Is this greater than what? That's right. So let's do the, the, the full 3D work for that. That's correct. So I have J of X is equal to J not of X plus J B of X. J not of X is equal to 1 half of Z minus H of X transpose R inverse Z minus H of X. That's our old friend. Are you me? Plus J B of X is equal to 1 half of X minus xb transpose b inverse x minus xb. This I can replace it by first order, replace by second order. Are you me? So if I replace it first order, I will have a quadric term. This is a quadric term. If I replace by second order, I will have a full quadric term. I have a quadric term. Are you me? So what does it mean? You have one more term on the right-hand side of the equation. You may have one more term on the right, uh, left-hand side of the equation. I'm going to ask you to solve the algebra for that. I'm not going to ask you who did it, but it is in your own interest to do some of these derivations, to have that aha. In other words, what does the background information uh, bring to the table in trying to determine? So ultimately, what is that we are going to do? We have to solve this linear system. We are talking about the composition of A. Who contributes? How does the Jacobian of this contribute to this? How does the Hessian of this contribute to this? How does B contribute to this? 
and who contributes to B? B is a known quantity, so Z contributes to B, XB contributes to B. So B, the right hand side, is decided by a function of Z and XB. The left hand side is to be decided by B inverse, R inverse, the Jacobian, and the Hessian of H. Okay, I, I said I'm done because this is easy, but it's, it's always good to complete the story. Thanks, Amit. Well, I know. That's right. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a yeah, recursive scheme. And you will see there's a lot of similarity between the deterministic recursive scheme and the stochastic recursive scheme that is called filter. And that's one of the reasons I'm going to do this very quickly. No, 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 there's no final difference here. Those law, those law, those law. The approximations are obtained by Taylor series expansion. There is no final difference. Then no, uh, uh, slow, slow, slow. I thought I'm fast, you are faster than me. <laughs> final difference means approximating the derivatives. Here I have the exact derivatives because H function is known. That's right. The approximation comes in not because of final difference. The approximation comes in because I throw the baby out of the bathwater. I don't carry terms third order and more. Good. Then there is some error in that. Of course. Of course. So some sensitivity tests are required for the model. Did you hear what he said? The model function is erroneous. If I know the error in the model, I thought the same question came somewhere earlier. Maybe the same guy asked the same question. If I know the model error, I would have corrected for it. Go slow, go slow. If I know I'm doing wrong, and if you didn't correct yourself, you're hopeless. Are you me? Not you, you. <laughs> so if I know the model error, there's no more error. If I don't know, I'm going to assume it's the word of God. So. If you want to keep coming back to the adequacy of the model, I don't think we are addressing that question. We are going to take a model as given and then proceed with that. With me? Good. So in other words, you cannot going back in cycles all the time, every time. You got to come out of the loop. Okay, good. Go ahead. What is the second question? That is right. That's a good question. There is no guarantee. In fact, if you have your function which has a multiple minima, there is no known deterministic method to find the global minimum. All the known methods to find global minimum has some kind of randomization, genetic algorithm kind of thing. Are you with me? So in this particular case, it is quite likely that, that if I start at my initial condition here, if I march through, I may end up here. I may miss this. Sure. You discover a method for finding the global minimum of a deterministic function, I, I'm sure you will probably be nominated for a Nobel Prize. I don't know. I'm, 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 like, I'm, I'm extrapolating, but, but that, 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 that would be a very grand result. Deterministic algorithm to find the, multi, the, 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 the global minima uh, is, 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 is one, of the, one, of the, one of the hard problems as of now. In other words, unless you involve some form of randomization, you can't have the hope of even solving that. Simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, um, those are all the methods by which. What's that? Yeah, that's right. Any other questions, please? I'm glad. Uh, how, do, uh, how do you address the chaos in the 3D world? Chaos? I'm not predicting here. There's no chaos in the static model. Are you with me? Okay, let me, uh, I think your, your question is a multi-folded one within the other. Uh, the, the, the chaos related to sensitive to initial conditions in dynamical system. So if I make small error, somebody, be, somebody amplifies it along the path, and that's the part of the dynamical system that we heard this morning. In here, there is no dynamics. 
So these are static models. 3D war is static at a given time. So whatever you do stays with you all along unchanged at that time. There is no dynamics involved. Am I, am I, or if I'm missing something in your know, question? Question, okay. Anything else, please? Good. Am I, am I, am I okay? Good, thank you. Uh, give the details, the, 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 the algebra and other things you can work out. This is again from another chapter. So what is the idea here? I have a Z is equal to H of X. This is M. This is M by N. This is M by 1. Suppose somebody comes and says, I have a new observation, which is equal to H, M plus 1 transpose X. So what does it mean? I had M observations. Based on that, I made an estimate of X. Because I am dealing with sequential, I am going to now talk about an estimate of M based on M observations. How many other me? So X bar M is the new notation that relates to the optimal solution when I had M observation. Suppose somebody gives you new information. You cannot say, I don't want it. You have to use it. So what do you need to do? By using this, by combining with this, I need to create a newer one, an updated version. What is the challenge in science? Every information must be taken into account in my decision process. So that I made all my decision based on this estimate, but somebody provides you new information. How do I update from here to here? There are two ways of talking about this. This, I, you can, one way would be a direct way, but you will see this is not an intelligent way. What is that we need to do? I need to now expand this vector z to, to, to z tilde. I need to expand this matrix h tilde x. This will be an m plus 1 by n. This will be an m plus 1 by n. This will be a n by 1. If I have this, my optimal x bar m plus 1 will be equal to h tilde transpose h tilde inverse h tilde transpose z tilde. Do you okay? But what am I trying to do? I, am, I, I already inverted a matrix in solving in here. So what is that I, I did here? x hat m is equal to h transpose h inverse h transpose z. This is for the m. So I inverted this matrix once. Then I'm going to come back and after each observation, if I have to invert a matrix, that's not too intelligent. Why? Inversion is going to take, as we saw in the last class, oh, n cube algorithm. You are throwing the money out of the window. So what is the idea here? Can I get this? So in here, I'm not using my old result. So what is the recursive method? The recursive method calls for being able to compute the new one from the old one plus a correction term, an add-on term. There, the computation of the add-on term should not be expensive. It should be much less than n cube. How many of you have made? Do you have an aha here? Hey, that's the sequential idea. So sequential method means, based on the current information, I have made a decision. A new information comes in. I would like to be able to update my information. The amount of computation I have to spend to be able to compute that update should be much less compared to resolving the whole problem all over again, ground up. This problem does not take into account the investment I have already made in computing the previous estimate. Any method that computes this is called a sequential technique. And that's exactly what Kalman's method does it within a stochastic framework. So what am I trying to do? Static problem, deterministic case, I'm trying to talk about update of the least square estimate. How many of you may? One guys. Good. So I would like to 
again quickly formulate the problem and leave as a homework. So you have a homework problem that can keep you busy for a week now. I hope you pursue this. Yeah. Sir, sir, you a new one. No, I'm not updating a new one. I'm, 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 I'm updating an old one when the new information arrives. How do you find new is good compared to old one? If there's no question of how did you know that this was good? If you're able to say something is good or bad now, you would have been able to say it earlier. How do you say some observation is good as the other? All observations are good. Why? It is you who decided these observations are useful. Are you with me, please? So there is a tacit understanding. I'm not observing anything useless. Whenever an observation comes, there is information about the unknown. There is no waste of information. Everything, whatever the instrument says, you, keep, you need to keep hearing. If the instrument tells you something new, you got to listen to it and you have to accommodate it. So there is no, there is no bad observation. Why? You have already decided what to observe. Are you with me? Good. So I'm now going to extend this simple matrix technique. I'm going to partition this H x h m plus 1 transpose z m plus 1. Are you there? Come on, guys. So what do I now need? This minus that is equal to e m plus 1. What is e m plus 1? Error in this equation. z minus h x, this extended thing. So what do I want? I want my j function, which is the one half of e m plus 1 transpose e m plus 1. This is equal to one half of one half of z z m plus 1. OK, um, um, I'll write that. So th this is equal to this is equal to z minus h of x transpose z minus hfx plus z m plus 1 minus h m plus 1 transpose x transpose z m plus 1 minus h m plus 1 transpose x even though these are scalars just to make them look good I'm, I'm getting this a, a, a bit of matrix algebra is needed here so if this is e this is m now what is this? This is my old guy. What is this? This is my new guy. You all have an aha? How many of you think I'm going fast? Any questions on this place? So what am I trying to do? I have an old measurement, old system. I'm attaching. This is the new independent measurement comes in. I'm attaching. I'm expanding my vector from m to m plus 1. I'm expanding the number of rows by 1. Are you me? This vector minus this vector, that's E. My J function is E transpose E. These are some of squared errors. Because of this partition, I can partition this function into two terms. This is my old friend. This is my new buddy. I now need to be able to get the gradient of J. This is equal to gradient of this term plus the gradient of this term. All of, all, of, all of you in the place? How many of you with me? I know you're getting to be lunch time, you're all getting hungry, but, 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 but we, need to be, we need to have an aha coming. Is it aha? That's right. So compute this, compute the gradient. Can you do that? Can, can you compute the gradient in, in here? That's right. If you compute the gradient and equate it to zero and solve for that, I'm going to get an equation, which I don't think I remember. Instead of making an error, I'm now going to quote it very quickly so that we can look at the structure of that equation, which is a very interesting equation. OK, so what is the structure of that? The least square estimate using m plus 1 observations is equal to, uh, is obtained by h transpose h plus <laughs> h m plus 1 h m plus 1 transpose times x hat 
h f plus 1 must be equal to h transpose z <laughs> plus h m plus 1 z m plus 1. That's pretty succinct and nice. Look at this now. This term is a new guy. So if there is no new guy, if there is no new guy, that's my old equation. How many of you with me? So it is nested. Now what is that I'm now going to do? So the new estimate is equal to h transpose h plus hm when hm plus 1 transpose inverse times h transpose z minus hm plus hm plus 1 zm plus 1. What do I would like to do? I would like to be able to express this as x hat m plus an add on. To go from here to here, I'm now going to use a, a beautiful lemma in matrix theory is called matrix inversion lemma. But before I go there, I want you to have an aha. We still have 10 more minutes before lunch. I want to make sure we cover all the, we touch all the fundamentals. Are you me? So let me quickly recapitulate what got me here. I had an old estimate based on M observation. You gave me a new observation. All observations are good. So I have to utilize that. I would like to be able to incorporate my new information contained in the new observation and transfer it to my estimate. I would like to be able to get a new, ob new estimate. I would like to be able to update my old estimate. Updating means having a correction term. So a old estimate plus a correction term gives you a new estimate. I, I'm not quite there, but I do know the new estimate must be a solution of a linear system. And how do I get this linear system? By simply minimizing this quadratic function. This quadratic function is essentially an embodiment of this calculation, which is the norm of the square of the error. And we have computed this now half a dozen times. You all know how to do. So from here, you compute the gradient equal to 0, do a little bit of algebra, get this. Once you get this, you can write this. Now, you all know how to compute. So, so what is the basic question now? If I know the, suppose, if I know the inverse of A, if I add a perturbation to B, uh, uh, to A, can I compute the inverse of A plus B knowing that A inverse exists? Look at it, that's exactly what it is. H transpose H is invertible. Why? It is symmetric, full rank. It's partially definite. But what is HM this? HM transpose is a row. You remember that? This is the row. So HM is a column vector, it's a row vector. That's called outer product matrix. In matrix operation, there are two kinds of operation. One is the inner product. How does the inner product look? Inner product looks like this. That's a scalar. The outer product looks like this. What is this? This is the matrix. How many of you know the outer product? Let's do it once more. Because not several hands. Uh, 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 A, B, C. A, B, C is equal to A square, A, B, A, C. B, A, B square, B, C. C, A, C, B, C square. You take this row multiplied by A. Take this row multiplied by B. Take this row multiplied by this. So such a matrix is an outer product matrix. Outer product matrix is a rank one matrix. Why? It was generated by one column. So this is called a rank one perturbation. I'm adding a rank one matrix to this. In 1930s, mathematicians, mathematicians are always way ahead of everybody else. They just for the fun of it create results. Nobody knew this was in use in data simulation. There's a, a, there's a lemma called matrix inversion lemma. It goes with several names. Sherman, Morrison, Woodbury formula. A beautiful historical account of this is given in the book by householders. Many books deal with this. Proof of this is very simple. I'm now going to quote that lemma and then give the final result. Are you there? What does that lemma give you? It tries to express the inverse of the sum in terms of the inverse of the one component plus add up. That's again a sequential algorithm. 
I would make that is sequential within sequential. I am looking at a sequential estimation algorithm within which I am going to be utilizing a sequential algorithm for updating the inverse of matrices. So if I have a matrix A that is invertible, if I am perturbing that matrix by a rank 1 transformation, how do I express the inverse of the sum in terms of the inverse of the original matrix I started with plus some perturbation ideas. So for, so this, this could be first order perturbation, I'm sorry, this could be a rank 1 matrix, it could be a rank 2 matrix, it could be a rank R matrix. There are several different versions of this lemma. I'm going to be utilizing the simplest possible version of this lemma. That lemma goes somewhat like this. Sorry. If P be an invertible matrix, if H is a vector, H, H transposes a rank 1 update of this, the inverse of this is equal to P inverse minus P inverse H, H transpose P inverse divided by 1 plus H transpose P inverse H. Hey, this is a very fundamental result in matrix theory. So knowing the inverse of P, I can compute the inverse of P plus H, H transpose that I can update. And that's exactly the problem here. This is invertible. This is a rank one update. All of it me? How many of you me? So set, this is a normal problem. Set P equal to H transpose H. Set H is equal to HM plus 1. Apply this lemma to this term. Do the arithmetic. Have you seen the cooking shows? The famous French chef, Julia Child. I, there is a movie by Julia. Did, how many of you have watched the movie, Julia Child? Oh, sorry, it's, it's, uh, she's one of the most famous cooks in the world. She had a cooking show. So she will say, in today's show, I'm going to make, I'm sorry, I can't imitate her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are going to make three dishes. Dish one, she will show all the ingredients. Then she will tell you how to chop, how to do these things, and then sh shove it under the oven or whatever it is, and then say, it will take 45 minutes, but just before the show, I cooked one, boom, there it is. Second one, chop, 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 I already cooked this one. Third one, chop, 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 third one, good one. Hey, we have a dinner, bon appetit, show is over. <laughs> Half an hour, three dishes. What is the idea here? You tell how to make, don't wait for the cooking, but produce the result. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm telling you all the ingredients. Are you with me? Come on, guys. As a teacher, teaching is the only thing I have done in my life. So I generally watch how musicians teach, how cooks teach, how coaches teach, how mathematicians teach. Are you with me? Yeah. Teaching is teaching is teaching. But there are no answers. So in a graduate level class, do you compute everything? No. You have to keep the students busy. So chop, 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 apply, do the algebra, out comes the result. Are you with me? That's right. So what is the result? Let's enjoy the structure of the result. That's what's more important in here. X, Xm plus 1 is equal to Xm plus P inverse H M plus 1 alpha inverse Z M plus 1 minus, uh, I will simply say H, H transpose X star M. There, H is H M plus 1, and my alpha is, alpha is a constant, and alpha is equal to 1 plus H transpose P inverse H. Hey, we are not delivered what we promised. The new estimate, it is the old estimate. I have preserved all my earlier work. I didn't destroy anything. I'm building on it. 
And what is that new thing? This is an add-on. Let us look at the structure of the add-on. And what is my P? My P is equal to H transpose H. So P is H transpose H. My H is HM plus 1, which is my new row. My X star M is the old thing. So what is this? If X, so this is a very beautiful interpretation. You may have seen formulas of this type in the first day when Chris was talking about. So if I knew X star M is the current estimate of the unknown, if somebody tells me there is going to be a new observation, I could predict. What is the predicted value of the new observation? H transpose X star M. The new observation comes into play. The difference between my prediction and the new observation, that is the innovation, the new information. I'm going to weight that new information by this term. I'm going to add to the previous. Are you with me? Hey, that's exactly the structure of carbon. Wait, which one? X star. X, oh, I'm sorry, not X star. Sorry. Hey, he's very careful. Thank you. X star. Optimal. Real me? Now let us talk about the, uh, the cost of computing this is much less than solving the whole system all over again. Not only that, it brings in the notion that underlie Kalman filtering within a very simple static scheme. I'm going to give one little example before we uh, depart for lunch. Are there any questions on this place? Within five minutes, I will wind up. One little example. How many of you have an aha? <laughs> Only one guy? Only one guy? Come on, guys. Uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 well, assuming that you have already done this in here. That's right. If you look at the structure of this game matrix, is very similar to that comes in Kalman. Yeah. Okay. Are you any optimal m? I think you should switch from direct method to iterative method. Yeah. No. In the, the sequential, there is no direct. Sequential means what? As some when new informations arrive, it is your job to take into account. There is no direct, there is no uh, iterative. No, no. Uh, see, if I have uh, already accepted the observation. Uh -huh. No, no, no. You have Z, which contains M observations, okay. in which you have one estimate. Uh -huh. And I have one more observation. Yeah. So as and when uh, one more observation will come, I will uh, do the similar thing. And uh, if I know the new estimate. That's what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to tell you, right? Okay. What is more, uh, I mean, uh, more expensive? As to consider, uh, say, M observation and do it uh, with. Are you going to do, if you put in R inverse in here? Uh huh. Uh, there's a corresponding, there's a corresponding value in that off. Sure, sure, sure. Are you going to do it here? Uh, I'm not going to do it. That's homework. Well, if I did it, that's a one semester course. I want you to understand. In my, I, I teach two courses, scientific computing one and two. In scientific computing one, I cover chapters four, I'm sorry, five through thirteen inclusive, plus appendices A, B, C, D, and a ton of MATLAB programming. And there's a one semester course. What's a one semester course at the University of Oklahoma or anywhere in the United States? A semester is sixteen weeks long. The last week is exam. Fifteen weeks. A three semester course meets three hours a week. An hour is fifteen minutes. After fifteen minutes. Okay, so 15 times 3, 45, 50 minutes lectures, I cover chapters 8 through 13 plus appendices. Wow. We can't do this here. One week. And we hit this, so six, one week, six lectures. Are you me? But then the aim is not a course here. The, you remember what I said yesterday? What is the aim of going to a, a seminars or a workshop like this? I want to know what I don't know. I hope you all... When you go back at each day, I hope you will write down what is that I didn't know yesterday, I knew today. That's the most important thing. Or what is that I didn't know, now I know, I need to know. Hey, that's, that, that's all. We, these workshops are essentially providing you the pathways. They're opening the windows. They're not going to hand carry you through the path.
They're going to go the train, good luck. That's the idea. Good. Within the first m observation, I have an estimate. Yeah. A new observation comes in. I have a. I have to compute the new estimate. I am computing the new estimate by not discarding the old estimate, but adding on to it. Now, my, my question here is: for instance, when we look at p, h mm -hmm. uh, if we are looking at the m plus two update, uh -huh. would that h change? Would that kind of add on to one? The the the, 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 the new thing will come in. So the z will become the z m plus one. That's right. 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 Okay. Good. Now I'm going to uh, very quickly talk about a very simple recursive problem. Suppose you want to measure your weight and you want to update your weight sequentially. So your your weight z <laughs> is obtained by one 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 x z one z two z m. In other words, it is u. I measured in a measured in weight on balance z one, another balance z two, so on and so forth. So here h is equal to the column of all ones. So what is h transpose h? Is equal to one 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 one. That's what we have. Therefore, what is x m or x hat of m? H transpose H inverse H transpose Z. What is this? This is n. What is H transpose that? That is called summation Z i. Hey, this is this is a row of ones. So what is this term? This term is one one one. Z1, Z2, Zm, that's the sum of that. So, hey, look at this, very natural interpretation. If you have m different measurements of your weight, what is the best estimate of your weight? The average. Are with me? How does the least square comes up? So what do we do? In, 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 even if you didn't know, your grandma would have done it, right? Grandmas are very intelligent people, grandmas do average. So what does it mean? The grandma solution has a square theory behind it. That's why grandmas are always intelligent people. Come on, guys. So now I want to be, are you me? The best least square solution is the average. Now I'm going to talk about the next one. So m plus 1 is equal to 1 over m plus 1 summation zi is equal to 1 to m plus 1. This I can rewrite as 1 over m plus 1 summation i is equal to 1 to m z i plus z m plus 1. This I can rewrite as 1 by m plus 1 summation z i plus 1 over m plus 1 z m plus 1. And z summation z i i is equal to 1 to m plus 1 over m is equal to is equal to x bar m. You remember that? that? That comes from here. Therefore, summation zi is equal to m times x bar m. If I substitute this in here, what does this become? m times m plus 1 x bar m plus 1 over m plus 1 zm plus 1. And what is that? So, your new estimate of your weight, when a new observation comes in, is equal to the old weight multiplied by this plus this. Hey, that's the version. That's that. This is what this comes into. Then you have a problem with this time. How many me? Now, what happens? Assuming your weight doesn't increase exponentially, this is pretty stable, right? Oh, there is female here and there. As m increases, this term goes to zero, your weight stabilizes. Are you may? Hey, very simple. So this is the recursive. This is the so this is called offline, this is called online. One is called batch 
another is called sequential. So batch mode versus sequential mode, online versus offline mode, online is sequential. All of it may. So quickly summarizing, I'm done with 3D wire. So I'm sorry. So 3D wire, it could be linear or linear. It could be <laughs> weighted, unweighted. It could be online or sequential or offline or batch mode. Are you there? Weighted means stochastic. Unweighted means deterministic. Linear, nonlinear. Online, sequential, offline batch. Hey, that's what we have seen. So they define materials. Chapters 5, 6, 7, 8. We also talked about many matrix methodology. We have not gone into the details thereof. So this finishes our descriptions of some of the most fundamental principles in data simulation, nuts and bolts, where the rubber meets the road. It is this, if you master, nobody can touch you. You fly high. So what is the next one? I'm going to do one lecture on 4 dr and one lecture on Kalman filter. And there is also one tutorial. In the tutorial, I'm planning to give you a very nice example of being able to recover the temperature of a skin from satellite measurements. I have a very simple nonlinear problem using 3D1. That's what we will do for the, for the uh, tutorial. And if, if time permits, we can also try to do a very simple dynamical problem too. Any questions, please? I'm sure all of us are getting hungry. Thank you all. So, what, 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 this, if you add uh, R inverse into this, the sequential way of doing it, you can derive a very similar formula. Of course, R inverse will appear all over. Uh, there's a caveat. And uh, either you find it out, or well, I think it would be good if you can work on it and try to find out what are the conditions needed on the R inverse so that such a formula can be obtained in the sequential way. It's not true for all general R inverses. You need to put a condition on it to get the sequential formula. Uh, so I think if you figure out what that condition yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. So your job is to figure out what that condition is. And, uh, One more.